Hi everybody, thank you very much for coming to um, this session, which is around uh, remove, no signal removing barriers to student engagement. My name's uh, Cathy Mennett smith um, I'm the Associate Dean Learning Teaching Student Experience at the University of the West of England Business School, and I'm currently Vice Chair of CAB's Learning Teaching and Student Experience Committee. And I'm going to hand over to Deborah. Hello, my name's uh, Deborah Layton. I'm currently Professor of Management Practice at um, University of Bedfordshire Business School, um, formerly the Interim Dean at Coventry, and before that I was the Dean at Bedfordshire, and where Cathy and I work together. Um, so uh, delighted that you've um, hung on to uh, the graveyard session this afternoon and hopefully uh, we'll have an interesting round table discussion. Okay, can we have the next slide? So um, what's important for us to just um, make you aware of is that this um, workshop has been um, this session has been put together from the CMBE workshop that Cathy and I ran some time ago. We got the idea for running a CMBE workshop on disadvantaged students um, around the move to digital and um, the barriers to student engagement. Uh, we held the workshop and so many interesting themes emerged that we then uh, put a proposal to present a roundtable um, session at this conference so that we could disseminate some of the themes that have come up th through the uh, workshop and also hopefully collect some more ideas today. So um, it's a kind of emerging uh, process really. So if we go on to the next slide, the idea is that, is it? Is it is the slide, yeah, the slides have stuck. Keep, keep talking. I'll keep talking. Yeah, I failed completely with the slides. So, um, so that, that's why Cathy's uh, moving them. Um, so the purpose um, of the session today is to draw together the themes that came out of the workshop, um, which had the same title, um, in order to um, uh, really inform our learning on um, barriers to remote learning that um, uh, mitigate the risks of, of systemic disadvantage. So we are looking to explore potential behaviours, emotional and cognitive barriers to uh, engagement. And um, we are hoping to be able to share with you some of the strategies that the workshop came up with for um, overcoming these barriers and to um, seek out the hidden um, student voices that may be an indicator of student disadvantage. So we're hoping that you'll gain an insight into the findings from the workshop and that you'll have the opportunity to share these as well as your own perspectives and experience. So what the way we'd like to run the session um, is if we move on to the next slide, which is the agenda, is we're just gonna give you an overview of the themes that came out of the workshop we're going to look at how um, we're going to look at in terms of two questions. First of all, how we can identify and remove barriers, and secondly, how we can re-engage with and support students impacted by the barriers. Um, and then we're going to have a plenary session and look at some next steps. And the slides are available for you to download at the end of the session if you want them. The way we'd like to operate it to make sure that we get to hear from you is um, that we ask you to post your comments in the chat rather than requesting to speak and we'll address the comments through the chat. Um, we think that um, that way it avoids one person dominating the conversation or one theme dominating the conversation. But um, if we do miss any of your comments in the chat, if you could um, just flag them again. Um, so some of the themes that um, we explored at the workshop, first of all, what exactly do we mean by student engagement? This has come up in several sessions um, during the conference in the last two days. Are we talking about activities that are linked with the achievement of intended learning outcomes? Or are we focusing actually, when we talk about student engagement, on performative measures such as student attendance, uh, participation, behaviour, the, the way they behave and their emotional expectations. 
and we explored um, various um, interpretations of student engagement um, across the institutions that were represented at the workshop. What um, are the key challenges to student engagement? So we looked at technologies. Um, again, these things have, have emerged during the conference, but technological challenges, access to um, computers and reliable Wi-Fi, and crucially, uh, IT support as well and advice environmental um, and locational uh, issues uh, around students who are at remote campuses and so on and behaviors we looked at um, the cameras on cameras off the house embarrassment arguments and uh, lots of other behavioral issues around student engagement we then looked at whether we can reliably measure whether students are engaged um, looking at the data analytics that are commonly used for this and um, looking at measures and drivers and some of the ethics um, around measuring students um, engagement. We started to explore barriers to learning, um, in particular looking at uh, barriers to assessment, uh, which have come up again today um, in, in some very honest uh, discussions at an earlier session today around uh, assessment issues from University of East London. Um, parties, barriers to participation and barriers to belonging and the reasons why uh, and the point was made earlier today that many of these um, issues actually relate to staff as well. Um, so things like um, Zoom fatigue and distraction and so on and uh, silence anxiety. So these were the key kind of themes that we explored and um, we, we received participant feedback around these. So if we could just move to the next slide, our intention is to really, through these two questions, um, generate uh, an online discussion with you and to just see whether there's anything that we can further explore and certainly that we can learn from your experiences. So the first question is, how can we identify and remove barriers to student engagement in remote learning environments? How do you think that it's possible for us to do that? So I'm just going to um, ask the question and see whether we get any comments in the chat. Perhaps, Cathy, you want to start the comments off in terms of um, your experience at UE. Um, yeah, so there's a comment in the chat about ask the students directly. And, and I think that was one of the big themes that we talked about in the CMBE workshop, because when you ask students directly, who are the students who you end up not hearing from? Um, hence the talk on this one about, about no, no signal, because maybe they're the ones with the barriers, but we're not hearing from them. Uh, so it's, that, that was a big theme, wasn't it, in the workshop, yes. Deborah, about yes. asking. Um, and, and, and Stephanie has just been saying, um, one of the things about the barriers is talk about them in open conversation with students. Um, so I, I, I'm assuming, Stephanie, you mean talk, talk about the barriers openly? Is that what you mean? You might want to come on mic and explain that one. Yes, she said, yeah. Yeah, so in in terms of um, barriers, um, students can tell us about the barriers, but I think we also realised um, from participants that there are a number of barriers that students are very reluctant to share, um, particularly around their environment and their um, locations and their behaviours. So it, it was it was interesting to discuss those. Um, I think the first port of call should always be the students. I think our concern was around the silent voices and um, yeah, and as Cathy's just said, how do they, do they actually know whether they have barriers? Do they think everything's going swimmingly? I think that's where the ethics came in um, because may, maybe we have data, I don't know what your institutions are like in terms of collecting data on, on student um, engagement and things like that. And so may, Maybe we think a student has, has got a barrier because we're concerned about their engagement profile. We had huge conversations about that. But maybe the student thinks everything's fine. Um, so it was, it was bridging those disconnect, disconnects. Um, yeah, and something about anonymity and asking students, so that there's a comment in the chat now, Deborah, about anonymity. We had quite a lot of conversation about that as well, didn't we, in the workshop? 
We did, and um, student um, and peer pressure as well uh, around some of this. So we we talked um, at a session earlier on today about the pressure um, the students felt to purchase work rather than do their own work because it was a lower risk strategy for them um, in terms of their engagement with assessment than actually taking the risk of, um, of having a go themselves at assessment and perhaps not succeeding. So um, I, th I think that that was an interesting one. Um, and I think, Stephanie, you're saying there that um, staying online afterwards, it's, it's, it's again recreating um, the kind of um, lecture theatre or seminar room um, uh, hanging behind afterwards and corridor conversations um, which are so valuable to those students who perhaps are not sure um, and silent students um, could listen and could have their questions answered. Um, I think again we had a lot of um, conversations around um, setting expectations um, of staff and students in terms of um, their engagement and setting expectations of uh, barriers. So I think we talked a lot about backgrounds to um, uh, on-screen backgrounds, didn't we, Cathy, as one of them. Um, so students who were embarrassed about their um, learning environment or their, their situation, um, we talked a lot about providing backgrounds with numbers for different student groups and so on. Um, and um, enabling students to um, uh, use backgrounds that uh, an anonymize um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the issues yeah we had a lot of conversation as well in the workshop around how moving online has been that fundamental shift where students were coming into classrooms on on their terms so they were coming into an educational establishment whereas now we've gone into their private space and the extent to which students are or are not comfortable with that. Um, and I don't know what it was like for you and your institutions when you pivoted, but we had a lot of students using Chromebooks um, because prior to that, when they needed better technology, they'd come onto campus. Um, so their technology wasn't fit for purpose in, in many instances. And so we had a bit of a lag while we got students um, access to the right technology. Yeah, so we've got um, uh, silent students again. There a comment from uh, Gregorius um, around um, uh, feeling the motivation to tell us about their challenges um, and joining offline. I think that's a really good idea um, to give students the choice. Um, we also had a, a quite significant conversation around um, uh, uh, students with um, special needs and their willingness to um, alert uh, staff to those um, and also to um, expectations of, um, of the performance of staff and I think this probably speaks to Keith's point on um, is it actually about an individual module leader um, having to come up with a solution uh, or should there be a clear, clear framework from the institution? Uh, on that um, and certainly it became clear during the workshop that um, some institutions were being very prescriptive about their expectations of staff and students and others were really providing very little guidance and um, there was often huge difference in expectations of students engagement even within course teams um, which is difficult. Okay, um, Sarah's just made the point about a uh, team of student engagement champions calling the level four students. We, we had a whole team here calling the level four students as well. And I think one of the things that was quite interesting that came out of those phone calls is some of the students who we were worried about, the students weren't worried at all. Um, and, and that's back to what do we mean by engagement and the ethics of engagement and the data that we collect on, on engagement. Um, and then there were other students who may be what was worrying me, students who on our metrics were not being flagged as as needing to have a call potentially, but we called all of our of our level four students. And some of those students who hadn't been flagged necessarily through our metrics were the students we should have been concerned about. So it's really difficult trying to isolate those students who um, might need us to step in and help them in some way. Yeah. 
Um, I, th I think also um, what uh, we tend to do ourselves as um, academics is to sometimes measure the success of an event that we participate in by the number of cameras on, cameras off. And, um, you know, you find yourself drawing conclusions about um, meetings with staff, for example, or large um, scale um, conferences or seminars thinking, well, there's only a quarter of people with cameras on. So what's that saying about um, their uh, engagement? And that's often because, as we've also heard this conference, academics are multitasking. They're actually trying to uh, finish their marking ready for an exams board. And they very much want to be part of this conference and these sessions, but they can't afford to um, participate fully uh, necessarily. So um, I think there's there's an element of sophistication in the way that we operate and that students operate as well, um, which uh, becomes more obvious the more events we, we attend. And I see Cathy's asking a question there about, do they answer the phone when you call? We, we get a lot of um, non-responses, as in the phone isn't even picked up. Um, and uh, we think there's something around them changing their numbers on the student records, Sarah, which is the point that you've made. Um, there's also, though, something about, I don't know what your institution is like, but this institution, when we call, we will come up as a private number. And students, and I've got to be honest, I often don't answer my mobile phone if it comes up as a private number. Um, and so there's something around infrastructure sometimes in institutions which make a tactic which should work less effective. So that's a good point. Sarah's just made that the callers have mobile phones. Yeah. OK, shall we move into the second question, which is um, clearly um, related um, to this, which is about solutions and it's interesting that uh, many of you have already moved into a kind of solutions um, uh, focus uh, to this but how can we re-engage with and support students who are impacted by these um, barriers um, and perhaps it, it's just worth um, looking at some of the potential strategies that we came up with at the workshop around this um, before we ask you for your comments on the question so if we could just move to the next slide and Kathy I think you this this was your slide around some of the things that you'd done and that we'd um, we'd done together at Coventry and um, and so on yeah um, I was just uh, before I go into that I was just going to pick up David's um, chat about how students might be engaging with resources and that we can't really see it sometimes. And that, again, was one of the big themes which we talked about. Do we sometimes value what is easy to see and easy to measure? Um, and which is why Deborah was talking about on one of those earlier slides about performativity. Uh, we have to be really careful that in, we don't confuse the two things, um, that performance and engagement are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, so that was one of the things that we were talking about. But yes, these were some of the, the strategies which came out from that workshop. One of the big themes that, that did emerge was around maybe we have motivational assumptions around our students. We assume that they all want to get a good degree or that they all want to have a professional career if you're teaching a discipline which is strongly linked with the professions. Um, and so does our language potentially alienate from them from the beginning? So if at the very beginning we're talking about this is how you can do you'll do well, do we end up with some students who can't imagine themselves as this successful graduate graduate that, that we portray? Um, and I think one of the themes that came out of that was to what extent do we really know our students and what they hope to achieve? Uh, and we need to start with where they are, where they are, rather than maybe thinking about where we think they might want to be at the end because maybe they don't share that vision. Um, one of the things around, do, do you know if you, you've listened or heard all students, probably consciously asking yourself, who have I missed? And sometimes that's where data analytics can really help because if you've got the mapping from your data analytics of the kinds of students who are in the classroom who, or who are engaging through your virtual learning environment, it means you can also start to build a picture of those who are not. And it's not about saying that the students who are not engaged are somehow deficit, but it is about seeing whether or not you can see patterns within the data that you've got, because then they will be the students who potentially you're not reaching if all of your mechanisms are through the learning experience. Um, or, or through phone calls or, or something like that. So something around using your data 
to ask yourself the really hard questions about what does this tell me about how my standard communications are maybe missing out particular cohorts of students. Um, we had long conversations in the workshop around, about being honest about the fallibility of data. I don't know what your institution is like, but certainly most of the institutions I've worked for over the years will say we have a student rep system and we have students on various committees and boards. Um, and then a decision will be made based on the students who are in those formal processes. And when you actually look at those formal processes, you, it's quite easy to identify types of students who are, who are not missing, who, who are not there. So their voice is not contributing to those decisions. And we talked about how do, do you play back the decision and ask the students, does this look familiar to you? Can you identify with this? Is this something that you could sign up to? Because again, maybe that's another way of drawing out the voice that you haven't heard in the process up until that point. Myth busting was a massive one um, and the extent to which we, we assume that students feel comfortable to have their say, but do they? And, and creating different ways for students to have their say, um, such as things like quite a few people in that workshop were talking around different types of speak up campaigns and the value of anonymity as opposed to being not anonymous and what kind of, of voices that, that will bring into the debate. Can, um, can I just come in there as well? One of the things around myth busting that we talked about was, um, you know the, the the myth that or the conventional wisdom that generation z are all hugely technology literate and that um, other age groups of students perhaps aren't and where we have mature students perhaps we make uh, assumptions about their preferences and again assume that all generation z students are really adept technology actually the crop up with different groups of students and it's really important not to generalize so that that came out very strongly yeah um around challenging the norms there's a few comments in the chat about texting um and using whatsapp and and things like that we, we had long conversations at our institution i'm sure you were the same about what channel is effective for what uh and it's that balancing act of if you've got too many communication channels it's confusing but likewise if you use a variety of channels for specific things that can actually aid students feeling like they, they have a way in we found mass texting is really useful if we want students to click a link a really short text message which says something important here click this link we found that's much more effective than emailing a link to students uh, we've used WhatsApp groups, different programs have used different kinds of social media mechanisms to talk to their students. What works on one program doesn't work on another. Um, and it's what are you using that social media for? And I think the social media space is quite good for making students feel part of something which is um, more informal. Uh, whereas email, the dreaded email, um, is probably better for the more formal communications. Uh, so we've had lot, lots of conversations around that in the workshop and in our institution. Something about making it easy. The big red button was something which um, I've seen various institutions try in different ways. But at that point where a student really needs to reach out, asking them to email somebody is probably not the way. And how easy is it within your institution for a student to go onto an internet and just click a button which basically says help? And where would that go? Uh, schools do this really well where a student can go onto their school website and they can just click a button and it takes them through to the wellbeing team immediately in the school to, to follow up. So there's something about how easy do we make it for students to get to the help? Are, are they expected to find out, know who, what help they need and then go and find it and then access it? And so how easy can we make it? There was lots of conversations about chatbots and artificial intelligence. Can you map the student journey around, you know, what do they need to know and when? Uh, and I'm sure in your institutions, you're doing quite a lot about that. Um, and the last three were much more about those informal mechanisms for engaging students, which are so powerful. So the informal coffee session um, and the power of the group dynamics. So saying to students, oh, bring a friend. It's much easier for somebody who feels slightly disengaged. It get, they get to a point where it's embarrassing to then come and talk to a tutor because they think that we're judging them for not having come and spoken to us earlier. So creating the informal spaces where they can, they can bring a friend. And that came up in the panel conversation yesterday. And I know Surrey have got their marquee, which is quite an informal space where students can just, just go in um, without an agenda or without feeling as if they have to start a difficult conversation. 
Um, there's another university I'm aware of, they do quite a lot around storytelling and getting the students to tell us their story and tapping into that creative side of somebody's mind where maybe through a storytelling they would tell us something very different than if we were talking to them like we're talking now in, in a conversation. Uh, so certainly there was a big theme in the workshop that we did around don't ignore those informal mechanisms which can be really powerful for unearthing one a different voice and creating space for students who maybe have found it hard to engage in the more formal mechanisms to find a way to connect with us uh, Sarah, you were talking about your comment here in the chat about blocking out sessions yeah that came up i think one of the things most people have experienced in lockdown was this absolute overload of one-to-one -one conversations and that was earlier in the chat as well about recreating that outside the lecture room having a conversation at the end at the end of a lecture because it was the same here our colleagues were drowning under the the volume of one-to-one -one bookings and appointments um, and we're certainly looking at some of the software which schools use for things like parents evenings where it's timed, that's one of the things about technology, you can you can bring somebody into a session, you know it's timed and it means you get to the point very quickly and if you need to follow up then you can follow up later. I think there's, a, there's also a point in the chat um, from um, about 10 minutes ago that David made around um, students might be engaging with resources that we don't even know about and so this comes back to um, the analytics really, either making sure that the analytics do include their accessing resources because they may be doing that quite creatively and in a very relevant way. So they may be accessing books, for example, that we're not aware of. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly um, if we, we shouldn't jump to conclusions um, about their engagement without knowing the full picture. So. Um, I think designing something, designing some measures which which go beyond um, our very basic definition of what student engagement is, is you know, is clearly very important. Um, is it worth us just popping back to the question, Cathy, just to um, remind people that we're looking at how we re-engage students who have been impacted by the barriers. So this is about the students who've gone off the radar. Um, and the numbers are quite alarming when people are honest about them. I think that's the first thing to say. Um, and they affect all kinds of institutions, um, whether, you know, it's um, Russell Group, um, Million Plus, Alliance, not uh, grouped institutions, private institutions, etc. cetera. Um, so um, we also had a conversation at the workshop around um, our kind of moral responsibility to re-engage with students that it's actually it's not just about um, our measures it's about at a human level we have a responsibility to re-engage with them so um, i don't know if anybody's got any um, suggestions about that do people feel, for example, that staff do see it as their responsibility to engage with students who um, don't appear to be engaging? Or do you think that um, there is um, uh, a tendency because of workloads to focus on those who are engaging? I think linked with that, I was just going to type it, but I'll ask it instead. Um, whether or not your institutions have, oh, it's five o'clock, we're meant to finish it, um, a systematic intervention strategy, because we found some students were being contacted by multiple people and other students weren't being contacted by anybody. Um, and it's, is there a clear systematic structure for intervention? Okay, well, in that case, shall we wrap up um, and um, uh, encourage everybody to continue this conversation within your own institution and within the CMBE and um, LTSE and other networks. Um, it's certainly an important topic. It certainly resonated with a lot of people uh, when we ran the workshop and when we proposed this again for the conference. So um, I think it's, um, it's an issue that's going to run and run. Um, but thank you everybody for your time and for your engagement and participation this afternoon. Uh, we really do appreciate it. I don't know if you want to make some closing comments, Cathy. No, just reiterate what you've said. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your, your comments in the chat. They're, they're making me think. So um, 
Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay, thank you very much.